I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Matt Rajansky, director here at the Kennan Institute. I have a very simple responsibility, which is to uh, do the housekeeping and then get out of the way so that Will Pomerantz, my colleague, can uh, host this fantastic discussion. I do want to say, though, uh, as a kind of a preface to, to this discussion, that um, it's timely in many, many respects, um, one of which, to me, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of because we're having a conversation now about sanctions and the efficacy of sanctions, and a lot of it does seem to be premised on fantasy. Uh, I hear commentary about how if we could only figure out where Putin's money is hiding, well, then we could control what he does. And I think that the fantasy of that is likely to be shattered in, in many respects by the, the depth of the research and the conversation that we'll have uh, thanks to Karen DeWish's book. Um, but in particular, it's this, this sort of um, leprechaun uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow notion that there's just an account somewhere that has $50 billion in it. And if we could just get a hold of that account, uh, then we could pull the right levers and change everything in Ukraine. Uh, clearly, that's false. Um, I want to uh, not only thank uh, uh, our, our speakers today, but also note that we have uh, much more to come. Uh, this Friday uh, at 10.30, we will have Sergei Plochy, um, who is the uh, Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History uh, at Harvard University and at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, uh, talking about his book, The Last Empire, Final Days of the Soviet Union. Uh, and then on Monday, uh, we will have at 1.30 in the afternoon a, uh, a discussion interview style uh, between uh, Igor Sergeyevich Ivanov, a former foreign minister of Russia, and now head of the Russian International Affairs Council with uh, Jill Doherty, formerly of CNN, who is sitting right there, uh, now a fellow here at the Wilson Center and affiliated with the Kennan Institute. So I hope you can join us for both of those fantastic events, and I'm very glad you're with us today. Will. Well, thanks so much, Matt, and welcome. We are indeed in for a treat today. Um, and if you haven't got enough discussion on Putin, well, I think we're going to hopefully satisfy your curiosity today. Uh, it is our great pleasure to have Karen DeWisha here to talk about her new book, Putin's Kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia? And I should add that the books are available on sale as well. Uh, Karen is the Walter E. Havinghurst Professor of Political Science and Director of the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies at Miami University in Ohio. Uh, she is a former Wilson Center public policy scholar, as well as a former guest scholar at Brookings. She has taught at many universities, including a long stint in the area at the University of Maryland. Uh, the author of numerous books, but I have a sneaking suspicion that this one really rises to the top of the list. Um, and she received her PhD from the London School of Economics. Uh, Karen will be followed by Professor, Professor Elizabeth Wood. Uh, for a commentary on her uh, presentation. Uh, professor Wood is the professor of Russian and Soviet history at MIT, and Elizabeth also will be joining us in, the, in January as a fellow here. She is the author of two books, including her most recent book, Performing Just Justice, Agitation Trials in Early Soviet Russia. And her current work, uh, which she'll, she will be pursuing here at the center, is also uh, on Vladimir Putin and the performance of power in Russia today. So with that, I turn the floor over to Karen. I'm going to stand. Thank you, Will, and thank you very much to uh, the Kennan Institute and to the Wilson Center, both of whom uh, hosted me when I was here, and I would also like to give a special thanks to the staff in the library who were really terrific in supporting this uh, research. Well, we are in a very interesting period for U.S.-Russian relations or for European-Russian relations. Here we have the most serious crisis since the Cold War in which one country expanded its territory at the expense of another, and the United States responded quite unusually by putting sanctions against the financial holdings of named individuals close to a certain Russian politician. This doesn't happen every day. We very quickly gain, uh, got accustomed to the idea of sanctions, but 
normally, if we could use that word, normally, there should have been some movement of the Sixth Fleet. There should have been some military-to-military -military response. There should have been um, more early NATO actions. And we need to think about why is it that they responded with targeted sanctions against individuals and their financial holdings. The reason, I think, is because these sanctions represented a public admission by the United States government of what it had known for over a decade, that Putin has built a system based on massive predation not seen in Russia since the Tsars. Transparency International estimates $300 billion are paid every year in corruption. Capital flight, according to official Russian Central Bank figures since, 19, 2000, uh, since uh, 2005, have been $335 billion. And Credit Suisse last year, in a very important study, not picked up uh, sufficiently in the West, a Credit Suisse, an, an organization that is not exactly devoted to the plight of the poor around the world, issued a report on wealth in Russia. And in that report, it stated that Russia now has the highest income inequality of any country in the world. 110 billionaires control 35 percent of the entire wealth of this very wealthy country. And before we say, yes, but GDP per capita has been increasing and all Russians are, are doing better than they used to, they state that the median wealth in Russia, the median, in other words, 50% are richer, 50% are poor, the median wealth in Russia is now only $871. It is the lowest median wealth figure of any BRIC country, a country that is a net exporter of energy, has a lower median wealth than India. It also now scores below Nigeria in its ability to control corruption, and obviously its willingness to control corruption. So what does this mean about what we can say about the Putin system? The Putin system nationalizes the risk and privatizes the reward to loyalists. The pattern we see now of the redistribution of Bashneft to the inner core has been in place since the beginning and even before UCAS. This is not a system in which robber barons create the industrial basis of a robust emerging capitalist economy. This is a system in which barons are robbed by value detracting state rating uh, elites whose sole position is determined by their relationship to the current president. Value detraction is an extremely important part of this picture. Most of the academic world, including myself, have spent the last 20 years focusing on democracy in Russia, on democracy building, on democracy sustaining, on democracy failing, but not on authoritarianism succeeding. And the basic conclusion that I came to in this book is that Russia is not a system under Putin of accidental autocrats. It is a system that was created with a purpose by intelligent design from the very beginning of the Putin regime. I started out with this project with the idea of finding the authoritarian moment. That was the governing uh, idea of, the, of this book. When did they decide what to do what they clearly have done? So I thought 2008. 2004, I went back to 2000 and realized after looking at mainly at elections, that's what I was interested in at the time, that even the 2000 election was fraudulent. Putin would not have won in the first round without massive fraud. That means that from the very beginning, the Putin project was not a project that was dependent upon trying to win. It was all about guaranteeing the win. Gleb Pavlovsky, whom we all know, was an extremely important 
member of the PR team around Putin in 2000 and who has fallen out with the Kremlin and vice versa. Um, he has stated, and I agree with this statement, that Putin was part of a, ver quote, a very extensive but politically invisible layer of people who after the end of the 1980s were looking for a revanche in connection with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The argument of the book is that this group failed in 1991, but they succeeded in 2000. It's the same group, ideologically. Not everybody, but ideologically. This group was seeking also to help themselves. They were Andropov trained KGB officers, very interested in economic liberalism, but with political control, and primarily liberalism for them. The book states that the whole story begins in the 1980s. Seeing the collapse of communist rule in Eastern Europe after 1989 and the loss of the ruling status of communist parties there, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union authorized the KGB and there are documents that are quoted in the book, to move money out of the Soviet Union, realizing that if the, if the CPSU lost its ruling status, in other words, access to the state budget without limit, they would need money to live in a multi-party system, something that the Polish, East German, and hung Hungarian parties hadn't thought about money started to flood. And it flooded in such amounts that they virtually bankrupt the Gorbachev regime first, and then when Yeltsin failed to find the communist gold, they also significantly handicapped the ability of the Yeltsin regime to succeed. What's interesting is that this was CPSU money safeguarded by the KGB, but when Yeltsin uh, leak, um, outlawed the CPSU, who did the money belong to? Well, it belonged to whoever knew what the bank account number was. And this started the scramble for, for offshore accounts. Kroll International was hired. They couldn't find the money. Um, hired by Gaidar and Yeltsin, they couldn't find the money. And it was a very interesting episode. So the core of the book starts in 1991, and I regard it as the most conservative analysis possible based on extensive interviews uh, of Putin's involvement in illicit activities in the 90s, his efforts to suppress legal cases that were started against him, and the rise to power of the group around him. I interviewed Russian, European, American journalists, activists, and many government officials, but I only used those documents that were publicly available. The reason that I did this is that there's quite a number, many, many books on Putin that assure us of their sources. What I'm trying to establish is that it's there, what we know about this episode, it's there in the written source material. We just need to do the work of discussing it, of researching it, bringing it to light. And the book is dedicated to free Russian journalism because it was Russian journalists who followed this story, first and foremost. And they wrote this story when there was free journalism. They covered it extensively. They were on Putin's tail from the very beginning. They couldn't write this now, but they were writing it in the 1990s. So I believe the account provides a baseline of accusations and information known and discussed in the 1990s and its contemporary import. You won't find in the book any repetition of, you know, hot rumors that we all hear about the participation of a certain high Russian government officials in 
the bunga bunga parties of Berlusconi. You won't find anything about a penchant for taking baths for their natural Viagra effect uh, in of bloody velvet drawn from Siberian reindeers. It's not in the book. But there's a lot in the book. <laughs> I can trust me, there's enough. <laughs> So the book contains major sections on bankruptcia, uh, on the food scandal in St. Petersburg in the early 90s, on Putin's involvement in the control and emergence of the gambling industry uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, Putin's involvement as a member of the board of the St. Petersburg Real Estate Holding Company, a company that was registered in Germany and that was investigated by Interpol and BND, for its involvement in the laundering of money from the Cali cartel, uh, his giving of a monopoly position to the Tamboff gang uh, in the Petersburg Fuel Company, his involvement in creating and using uh, source money from the mayor's contingency fund through a company called 20th Trust, which led to a criminal case number 144128, and the unauthorized use of funds from the mayor's contingency fund in, uh, in getting a apartment for himself in St. Petersburg, uh, which led to a criminal case 18-238-278-95. What I'm doing just by mentioning these numbers is to say there is the data. There is the data. It's presented in the book, but there is a lot more. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about only four things. Two people, a place, and a document. The two people, Vladimir Smirnov and Viktor Zolotov, two people who are not in the uh, public eye that much. Vladimir Smirnov. Smirnov is regarded by Russian opposition figures as one of the cutouts between the mayor's uh, office and Putin's committee uh, in the 1990s and the Tamboff uh, mafia gang. He's a smart guy, he's trained as a physicist, but nevertheless, he, was, he is said to have been the person who was involved. In the early 1990s, there was a food crisis in St. Petersburg, and the very first thing that Putin got himself involved in was giving licenses to various companies, some of whom only were established um, weeks before the contract was awarded. One of them was headed by Vladimir Smirnov, called Nevsky Dom. When the uh, St. Petersburg legislature investigated these contracts, in which the minimum amount that went missing was $122 million, but the total number of, uh, the total amount of contracts awarded was a billion dollars. But they had access to the um, documents governing $122 million. Their conclusion was that the Committee on Foreign Economic Relations, Putin's committee, distributed contracts in the interests of licensees and not the city. This is a quote from the documents. And that Vladimir Putin should be removed from his post and the case should be sent to the prosecutors. The prosecutors sought to pursue this case, but it was closed down by Subchak. Vladimir Smirnov should have been cast to the curb, but was he? No. He then became, in 1996, the person listed as the leader of the Ozero Cooperative. He's listed as the leader. Not Yakunin, not Fursinka, no, Smirnov. And most people focus on this gated community that they established without asking the much more important question, why did they set it up as a cooperative? There's private property. Just get the property Establish your, build your cottages next to each other and have, you know, saunas in each other's saunas. They were doing this all over Russia at the time. 
Why did they establish a cooperative using the Gorbachev cooperative laws? Because, in my opinion, they were able to establish a cooperative bank account number. And according to the Gorbachev laws, it's all for one and one for all under the cooperative arrangements. So, bank account number, who said I couldn't, we didn't know the number. Here it is, 1804610008. It was established, it's listed in the documents, and all those people whose names we know as being close to, to uh, Putin from the very beginning had access, according to the law, it's very important under Putin, to a joint bank account from 1996 onward. So you would have thought that Smirnov would settle down. He's, he's in with the, the big guys. You would have thought Putin would settle down too. But they went on to be on the board, and, di and in Smirnov's case, to direct SPAG, the St. Petersburg Real Estate Holding Company. And SPAG was also, uh, also on the SPAG board was Kumarin, the head of Tambov. SPAG was investigated by the BND for laundering the Cali cartel money. And of course, Russian mafia money too. But the BND wasn't looking at that time for Russian mafia money. They were looking for Cali cartel money. And that's how they found it. So there were BND raids and there were arrests. And then Gerhard Schroeder came to power and the case against Putin was suppressed. However, the US government leaked uh, documents, well, leaked results of their own uh, investigation in which they said that there was a sheaf of intelligence reports linking Putin to SPAG. And as a result of that, they succeeded in getting Russia placed on an international money laundering list. 2000. All right, Smirnov is certainly rich enough by now, so why doesn't he go abroad and live out his life? No, he, Putin goes to Moscow uh, in 96. He becomes president in 2000, and he uh, appoints Smirnov as head of Technob Export, Tenex. Tenex is responsible for up to 50% of the world's trade in nuclear materials. It was also the U.S. partner of in megatons to megawatts, and it received $3.5 billion in U.S. aid. It provided nuclear materials for the Bushehr reactor in Iran. This is serious stuff. So when we talk about, you know, Putin being concerned about Iran's nuclear potential, well, I mean, He's having saunas with this guy. This guy's the leader of the Ozer Cooperative. So he should be concerned, but he certainly could control it. So that's Smirnov. And Zolotov, the other person. When Putin became the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, of course, deputy mayors in all cities have security. And Putin, of all people, could rely on his friends in the former KGB, to help provide security. So why was it, why is it, that he chose to hire a private firm to provide security? That firm was Baltic Escort, still exists today. And the head of the, uh, the two people who were head of Baltic Escort were Viktor Zolotov and Roman Sepov. Zolotov was regarded by St. Petersburg journalists as the person who provided the muscle to protect the Chornina, the black cash that made the world turn in St. Petersburg. Uh, and the, particularly when gambling was um, controlled and brought legally, brought into the legal sphere, that Zolotov and Baltic Escort and Sepov controlled access and took the tribute. So Baltic Escort, what happened to those people? Well, Viktor Zolotov became 
per, uh, Putin's personal bodyguard in 2000, and he was his personal bodyguard until 2014. He is now the head of all the Ministry of Interior internal troops. In the event of any massive outbreak of uh, trouble against Putin, Zolotov is the one who would mobilize the forces. Zolotov is the one who brought us that horrible scene in the last um, inauguration of the strelka of black cars going through Moscow, a Moscow that had been emptied for the inauguration. All those cars going through a dark, uh, not dark, it was a brilliant day, a, 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 an empty Moscow, basically giving the message, you rose up at Bolotnaya, so what? We can, we can maintain this regime without you. It's an interesting story about Zolotov, and I'll just tell you that and then move on. Um, Zolotov came to New York in 2000 to do the security prep for Putin's first trip to the United Nations. And, of course, in that regard, he met with Mikhail Trepashkin, who was the resident uh, in the New York consulate at a time when Lavrov was the ambassador. One assumes unknown to Zolotov and his colleague, Yevgeny Murov, who was with him. Trepaskin was working for the United States, and he defected at the end of 2000. And he wrote a very interesting book, uh, an in extended interview with Pete Early called Comrade J. Very interesting book, in which he said that in Brighton Beach, they went to Natasha's, and they talked about how this is Murov and Zolotov, how they, they had hoped to be able to implement a plan to kill, at that time, pres presidential chief of staff, Voloshin, because he was standing against Putin, and blame it on the Chechens. But realized when they decided, you know, okay, Voloshin and then who, that the list was so long that there would, quote, be too many to kill, even for us. Zolotov and Murov are the chiefs of the two agencies that are in charge of the black box. All right, if you're feeling happy, then we'll just go on to the place. <laughs> so the place is Spain. Spain. I've always been interested by why it was that Putin went so many times abroad and so many times to Spain. So I started to investigate this and to talk to people and so forth, and there's quite a lot on his trips to Spain. Uh, the accusations that are in the book that are repeated from uh, Russian sources, and I can go into those sources, is that property was built in Spain with money from the St. Petersburg Mayor's Contingency Fund, initially for reservists. But it turns out they're all reservists when it comes to a free trip in Spain. Um, that this, this t skimming off of money started with the Leningrad Communist Party Executive Committee, the Len uh money, and that the first hotel, the Perugia, was vi built in uh, Torre Vieja in Spain, and it's still standing. The lead investigator f in a case that was brought by federal authorities into the activities of Sobchak and Putin, remember Sobchak fled to Paris, but it's, and the, it's often forgotten and rarely mentioned that Putin was named in that investigation. So the lead investigator, Andrei Zikov, uh, has stated in nine interviews that Putin made 37 trips to Spain on false papers, including when he was the head of the FSB. 
that the investigators, the prosecutors, gar gathered 110 volumes on this case before it was shut down when he became president. And 110 volumes, he states, were handed over to Radio Liberty for insurance. I've confirmed with Radio Liberty that they were in receipt of those volumes, and unfortunately for all of us, they passed them on to an agency that likes to classify things. But it does mean <laughs> that people in the U.S. government had 110 volumes. What happened in Spain? In Spain, after Putin went to Moscow, the group uh, within the organized criminal world who had benefited from him up until that time and, and those who were in power uh, left the country and they went to Spain. So Gennady Petrov, Alexander Malyshev, set up in Spain. Others in the Putin circle bought properties that were adjacent. Gennady Reznik, who's now the head of the Duma's Anti-Corruption Committee. <laughs> Leonid Raymond, who became the Minister of Communications and was regarded even by the Russians as the most corrupt of all the ministers. And the Spanish authorities, acting on requests from Interpol, started to tap phone calls coming from these places. And as we know from WikiLeaks, uh, they had phone calls from Petrov to four sitting ministers in the Putin government, including especially Anatoly Serdyukov, who regarded, was in his uh, speech patterns, regarded Petrov as his own boss. So in 2008, Operation Troika was launched, and Petrov and Malyshev were arrested. Russian high officials, including Medvedev, flew to Spain, wondering what has happened to our boys. They're, 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 some bad things are happening to them in these nasty Spanish prisons. So the women were released, wives and so forth. Um, Petrov and Malyshev were released to house arrest. Petrov is now back in Russia, in St. Petersburg. The trial will evidently, according to the prosecutor, Grinda Gonzalez, will, is scheduled to resume this year. So one hopes that it does, but he's stated that this group laundered billions of euros, billions of euros from Russia and not only Russia. So that's the third, the document. And that's my last point. The document that I, th I found very chilling when I found it, I was very happy to find it, but it was not, didn't make me very happy, uh, comes from Commerçant, May 3rd to 5th, 2000. They ran three days of articles on a document that had been leaked from the presidential administration, prepared in 1999, titled The Reform of the Presidential Administration. This document was admitted to exist by the Kremlin, but they, they claimed that it was only a draft. However, everything that was in it was implemented, in my opinion. In this document, which is uh, about 44 pages long, and only part of it appeared in Commerçant. And I should say immediately, it disappeared from the archive in Commerçant, and I was able to find it. In this document, each department is given open and public tasks, D Department of the, pu of the Presidential Administration, as well as secret or actual tasks so that the public presidential administration could tangibly and concretely influence all political processes that are occurring in society. And 
this is a quote, if the president really wants to ensure social order and stability in the country during his rule, then the self-governing political system is not needed. That's something we would call democracy. Instead, he will need a political authority that will create the necessary political situations in Russia and the near abroad, and the near abroad. Goes on to state, all the special and secret activities to counteract the opposition will be entirely in the hands of the special forces. Opposition media outlets will be driven to financial crisis. And this is the one I particularly love. In an early indication of their cynicism and seriousness, the open functions of the presidential administration in relations with the opposition is to lock in constitutional norms and join forces with the opposition in the fight against extremism. But the closed function is it is necessary always to ruin the coordinated plans of all opposition in general and each oppositionist personally. This was written in 1999. So in conclusion, while the book certainly goes up to the present day, its real focus is on the basis of this regime. And I believe that all was known by 2000. The group that he brought in with him from the 1990s is the same group that is in power today. The failure by the West to confront this was a political failure, not an intelligence failure. Everything in the book was known and knowable. And clearly, the intelligence services of Britain and the United States in particular, but Germany as well, knew much more. This was a failure of policy from looking into Putin's eyes and seeing his soul under one president to a reset under another. The sanctions introduced in April represent a closing of the circle and an admission that the US government has known this and they know what they're dealing with. Needless to say, the Russians would like a second reset. I hope we're not so foolish as to think that any reset with this group would be to our advantage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much, Karen. Elizabeth. All right. I'm just going to sit here because I want to be brief because I think uh, the normal role of a discussant is to liven things up in case nobody has any questions. And <laughs> I am quite certain um, that you are very likely to have uh, co uh, comments. Um, so I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. Uh, I have to start by saying I think this is a stellar performance, an amazing book. Um, I've been waiting for two years since you and I first talked about it, uh, waiting to, uh, to read it. I also want to commend Karen publicly for the daring that is going into this book. Um, you document not, as they would say in Russian, uh, not just a few people who have died for working on this issue. And I think you know, we as an audience and we as a country are very indebted for you, to you for taking this very, very, very brave st st uh, step and, and for researching it meticulously. I mean, I think the research is absolutely of the top caliber. caliber. I'm particularly interested in this book, and I think uh, perhaps this is the reason Will suggested I would uh, be a decent commentator, because I've been working on the Putin regime uh, and the appearance of power that I think masquerades this uh, kleptocracy. Um, and I'm interested in the creation of a facade of autocracy, the pretense that one man rules, when in fact what I think Karen DeWisha is showing is that it's a network and also a facade of democracy because this is a man of the people, this is a, a regular guy, this is a guy who uses tough language, so he must be speaking the truth, he must be authentic. I'm very interested in the ways that was also constructed in the same time period to make it look like he's the guy, he's the, he's the real person, um, and it's not being uh, manipulated, controlled from below. Um, that said, I wanna, and I, I'm gonna be giving a talk 
uh, at the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson Center, I don't know, in this room or elsewhere, wherever the works in progress are in uh, January, so um, January 13th, I think. Um, I'm also very, very interested in a point that um, Karen makes but doesn't uh, delve into, which are the, the ways in which this system looks like a very old, old system. In medieval documents, we have discussion of tribute, of dain, which is the, the Russian word for tribute, and of karmlenia, which is officials feeding themselves through tax collection procedures. Uh, Peter the Great put in his fiscali to figure out new ways of collecting tax revenues and new ways of bringing money into the state coffers, but they were perfectly legit to bring money into their own uh, pockets. I think it's also very interesting, uh, uh, as, a, as a historian, that there are a number of uh, Soviet parallels as well. The creation of, crea of substitute organizations like the Soviets, the Soviet Union was named after the Soviets, even though real power was in the party. The creation of shell organizations like the women's section of the party, which I have argued in my first book, uh, were fake. And also the ways in which from the beginning the organs, as they were called, the Chekhad and the KGB, were connected with the state official power. And also, um, I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which they uh, absorbed the, the third section or the czarist police. So, you know, the uh, famous move Yeltsin was looking for, the Russian idea, he failed. Uh, Putin uh, also tried initially to figure out a Russian idea. He figured out an anthem and he figured out, uh, you know, a few of a flag and a few other things, but could not come up with a Russian idea. And the sad thing is, what is to how does this relate to the Russian practice, and, and is the absence of ideology, or I the absence of a Russian idea, in part because there's so much concentration on these practices. So what I, I want to um, stress that I think is really remarkable in this book is the tangled web of interrelations, mafia, oligarchs, bureaucrats, that they're utterly uh, interconnected. I think sh uh, Karen has um, identified a number of mysteries that we knew about in the Soviet and post-Soviet field. We knew that the gold disappeared under Gorbachev. We didn't know why. We knew that there was no food in Leningrad. Many of us experienced that in 1991. We didn't know why. Um, we knew that there were a suppression of justice, but we didn't know. We didn't know, as I learned from the book, that Putin was not only, cre as a lawyer, creating these licenses, he was creating them with no signatures, w that they would not stand up in a court of law. This is um, deeply shocking. I, I've, I'm finishing a piece right now in which, in the two th in just a week before the 2000 elections, he said, you know, is it really about Tampax or Snickers? You know, he he, there was a blatant disregard for elections, but um, that there was also this blatant um, financial manipulation, I think, is is um, new, important, and uh, will raise many, many questions. The question I want to flag is, I think there's a very interesting tension in the book that I'm sure you're aware of, um, Karen, but I, I want to push you. I think that's the best function of a, of a commentator. You alternate between talking about Putin's malevolence on page five, that's a quote, Putin as an arbiter, Putin as uh, the one who keeps the sistema going, the figurehead for the structures and the criminal elements. You talk about them working for the purpose of strengthening Putin's hold on power. Um, so I have a qu I am interested to see to what extent do you think this one man was seeking to be the center of power versus a possible alternative interpretation of the um, boyars, as we would say in the pre-Soviet period, seeking to find one man that they could hold up as the top guy. In other words, is this one person looking to, to pull strings, or is this actually a wheel where we, they've identified, okay, the one who will stand for us, and therefore the one we won't let be challenged. Although I still think in 2011-12, there may have been thoughts of, of uh, overturning him because the per personal attacks on Putin were so strong. But in any event, um, and then, so that's sort of the main question is how do we read all these strings? Which, which way would you put it? Is it that they've, in a sense, created a VVP, as people in the field call him, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, as the figurehead. Uh, because I you need one, and it's an autocracy, or it's a strong government. And to what extent have, has he pulled their strings, made them this way? That's, hard, I think, hard question number one. 
Hard question number two is about sources. And um, I, I don't want to for a second suggest that you've used anything less than the <coughs> best sources you could find, but you've obviously got a big range of sources. You've got um, everything from lawyers and insiders to opponents and people who've fallen out with the regime, right? We all do that. that that's, that's the source for anyone. But how do we, is there a way you could characterize that spectrum from most, if you, I, 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 you know, maybe that you want to take other questions, you don't want to answer mm -hmm. mine, but how <laughs> would you, um, who, what would you say are the sources that you really, really rock bottom trust versus the ones that are, could be Berezovsky plants? Could be uh, Nemtsov's uh, dissatisfaction. Could be muckrakers who are looking for things. I, I'm convinced that this is th that your argument holds because of the sheer volume of the sources. But I still think you're going to have somebody who asks, and I might as well in a smallish audience um, go ahead and ask it. Uh, I call this the emigre problem. U.S. foreign policy has often been criticized for listening to Afghan emigres who said, you know, you've got to go into Afghanistan. Iraqi emigres who say you've got to go into Iraq or the Gulf War or uh, Poland or whatever. Um, to one extent, are malcontents creating uh, this? Because we, we, we can't entirely take the U.S. government's knowledge as our talisman. There's U.S. government investment in and Cold War thinking and so on. So, so that would be, um, how, you know, what, what would you, how would you characterize the most to the least uh, trustworthy, if you, if you wanted to take that? And then the last thing um, are a couple of smallish questions. No, not smallish questions. I take another one. Um, I, I, I'm curious about your view of the sanctions. To what extent, if we name these individuals, do we continue the trend of personalizing power? in Russia. I've been very heartened that political scientists have finally started really talking about a personalist regime instead of the weasel of a hybrid. I, I, I'm going to get in trouble with the political scientists, but I think a hybrid is really fundamentally a weasel term and that we need to fight, try to understand how this system works. Um, uh, a kleptocracy is, is a good term, um, I think, but is it, is there, is, if, if this is a kleptocracy, is the, um, sanctions, um, does that change it or does that just go after these individuals and still leave the problem? In other words, if we had regime change tomorrow and Putin were toppled, I've been having a recurring nightmare. What if a Kadyrov came to power? Or what if, you know, would, would things change? That's a question. And then another, uh, I, I'm, I seem to be having hard, uh, uh, not such easy questions today. Are we seeing also now a new period in Russia where they've given out all the goodies? And the um, recent arrest of Yevtushenkov could signal the beginning of a terror. Is, is the terror, is the attack on individuals related to, okay, we've given out all the goodies and now there's going to be reprisals to try to um, go after them. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that it's very interesting to me that this pattern you identify, which I, I love the term, um, nationalizing the risk, privatizing the rewards, I think it's also been what's been going on in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine with setting up uh, these uh, fake uh, reenactors like uh, Strelkov, Baradai. Uh, they have deep money connections with Malafiev, who is one of the orthodox oligarchs, who is friends with uh, Yak Vladimir Yakunin. They, they pride themselves on having, and so you create these shell orthodox oligarchies. So I'm wondering whether you think that there's a possibility that they're doing the same thing in Eastern Ukraine. So, enough. Um, Will, you can... No, I'm, I'm going to turn it uh, to Karen to take the first crack at five questions. <laughs> 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 at least five, I think. <laughs> Maybe a couple of... I'm sure that what I have to say will overlap with other questions, too, and we don't want to go on too long. Um, Vladimir Putin, in my opinion, is malevolent. He's also the arbiter between groups. He's also the creator of a sistema. And I think that, in my own opinion, why I came to really break with him completely was this is a person with some significant talent. Mm -hmm. He had choices. Mm -hmm. He could have done better for civil society. 
he could have done better for the population of Russia. He chose not to. These were all choices he made. So I personally don't feel the need to choose between those character attributes. Um, do, can we believe opponents? Oh, well, I think that when you have people who were, let's say, uh, Sherpas for, <laughs> for Putin in for five years, when you have people like Rishkov, Nimsov, and Milov, who were deputy ministers or deputy prime ministers, one would have to say that their views are worth considering. Um, and when they present data, as has been the case in the, s the very detailed studies um, on corruption or in testimony to Congress, it's imperative upon us to look at this seriously. As I, regard it, I just regard this as a data mining operation. So it's not to say that just because Kas Kasparov, to take another example, says something that we should believe it. Absolutely not. I mean, some of the things that are said about Putin's private life, I mean, really? I mean, maybe. God forbid that any of us should have that private life. Well, I don't know, any of the people I know anyway. Um, I, I will say also, because it, it comes to a point that I was going to mention anyway, about sources. One of the things that um, I've done for this book, which is going to make certain people even more upset with me, is that I have, as of today, uploaded all the documents I used onto my own, onto a new website. So if you Google Putin's Russia with a, with a hyphen, Putin's, Putin, Putin's hyphen Russia, and maybe put in there Miami University, God knows, or Dewish or something, it'll come up. And in that, I have, um, is Pyotr Podkapayev here? Pyotr. So I have the document from Kommersant that this excellent person, Pyotr Podkapayev, who's now working in D.C., and you should all hire him, who translated it in from really pretty bureaucratic and not very elegant Russian, because who was it written by, into quite good English, although he into accurate English, let's say. So you can read that document in English and judge for yourself what they were planning. Uh, all of Marina Salier's documents from the food crisis I have uploaded. All of Kolesnikov's documents I have uploaded. I have uploaded a YouTube video that I don't know who put it on YouTube, but it is Putin in 2000, the night of his election preening like the new czar in front of Pavlovsky, uh, Zolotov, uh, Lesson. It was the night. This was a private video. And you can decide for yourself whether he planned personalistic rule. That was the night he went to Chechnya? Um, well, the night of the election. The, the night of the election. They were busily looking at the, the incoming uh, results. Um, Sergei Ivanov, I mean, you know the cast of characters. Uh, so there are 2,500 footnotes in the, in the um, book, and I've put the entire bibliography with live links on this website. So please, judge for yourself. This is what we should be doing. In addition, Andrei Zikov, the lead prosecutor for especially important cases that um, was like Marina Salier cowed into being silent for 12 years and came out of hiding in St. Petersburg and put nine uh, um, testimonies of the details of his investigation on YouTube. Some of those are no longer there on RuTube and on YouTube. But I captured them all, and they are transcribed. And that's a lot of work. But they are there for all of you to, to, to look at. I've told Miami University that th I hope they have <laughs> capability to withstand a DDS, but I think they do. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so 
Um, Yevtushenko. I think the, the arrest of Yevtushenko, Yevtushenko and the refusal, I think more importantly, the refusal f to release him from house arrest, despite the petition from the Union of Industrialists, is a, is a signal that we will come after it if we need it. And of course, there were internal reasons, you know, greed and so forth, why others close to Putin might want Bashneft. But I think um, it, for Putin to allow it to continue suggests that, like all that he does, there is signals, signals to the other 110. You've brought your money home. Thank you very much. Now it's now now we'll be needing it. So and Tim Chinka very publicly has said that all the money he made is available to return to the state if it's required. Uh, Don Bass. Well, I've written a lot on this. So uh, all I will say is that there is now a colonial class that has risen arisen in Russia. Uh, these are people who go around from uh, Abkhazia to South Ossetia to Trans, um, Transnistria and to Donbass. The new head of Donbass came from Transnistria. He had been the Oman chief in Latvia in 1990. Not a good person. So um, there's a whole group coming out of FSB, GRU, kind of middle-ranked people who are capable of making good money doing this kind of predation on a, local, on a local basis. And I think they are, of course, also helping the mafia to establish their, their domain in these places. And the great thing about these places, like Abkhazia, Transnistria, and Ossetia, is that we don't have embassies there. Transparency International will not be setting up an office in, in these places. They have diplomatic relations with each other, but not with anybody else except Nauru. Um, so this is important for offshore banking operations, for, for counterfeiting, and all those things that are happening. Well, I'm going to throw it open. I see already a lot of hands uh, going up here, but I do want to take the fr another question here. And it's kind of just touches on what Elizabeth was talking about as to who created Putin, who was pulling the strings. In your book, you talk about the rise of Putin and his career. But really, the most puzzling aspect is how he became Yeltsin's successor. Why did Yeltsin decide, of all the people, that Putin was going to be his successor? He was still a relatively obscure person. But when he raised him to prime minister, he not only raised him to prime minister, he said he's going to be the next president as well. That's and right. no one believed him because okay. Putin was a complete unknown at the time. Now, admittedly, certain events would transpire that played to Putin's strengths, as it were. But I, I, I want to go back to the question, why did Yeltsin decide that Putin was the one who was going to be his successor? Well, I spent a lot of time in the book on this subject. So it's half in half of the book is in St. Petersburg and half of the book is Moscow. So uh, why did Tatiana decide mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he should be the successor? And why did uh, Berezovsky decide? And I think the answer to both of those questions, at which they sold to uh, Yeltsin, was that he didn't give up Sobchak and he won't give, up, give us up. Berezovsky was very important in preparing the White House for the coming presidency of Putin. We know that. So Strobe Talbot has talked about it openly, that he came and got a meeting with Strobe Talbot, even though Talbot didn't trust him, that, and said that, you know, this guy Putin, he's the real deal. You know, he's going to be a great guy. He's going to continue on the path. And within, within three days, of his inauguration, the tax police, who were wearing balaclavas, rappelled down a, <laughs> a building and crashed into Kosinski's media offices. <laughs> Three days. And Berezovsky s said, he, Ber Berezovsky, I don't give him any credit for honesty at all, but he did say, and I think he honestly believed it, that what have we done? We've let the black colonels in. He realized that this, this was a mistake. Um, but at the time, he did not realize that there were two parallel tracks that Putin was on. 
a track of getting Yeltsin to name him and giving the signals to the oligarchs that he was going to protect their wealth and the track of the FSB people. And he immediately, when he came to power, he threw the oligarchs out. He gave them a signal that they had to play by his rules. Okay, we'll take some questions right here. Wait. Uh, my name is Steven Shaw. I understand that Putin's former boss, uh, uh, hey, GB, Oleg Kalugin, who is now an American citizen and works a few blocks from here, and he is under a death sentence in the Soviet, in, in Russia. Um, do you mention about the how, um, what the, 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 um, the relationship between Kalugin and Putin and how he was able to um, sort of leapfrog up in and advance in what was then the KGB. How Putin leapfrogged or how Kalugin leapfrogged? Well, well let's just start with Putin. They fell out. Mm -hmm. They fell out. Um, Kalugin, from the early 90s, had identified himself as somebody who wanted to modernize and westernize the new security uh, apparatus. And that wasn't on the agenda of most other people in the FSB, so he found safe haven here. Um, he certainly openly accused, talked about the stench of corruption coming from uh, St. Petersburg, very specifically in writing. So what did he expect from that? Wayne. Hi, uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. At the very end of your presentation, you raised rather tantalizingly the question of United States government policy, which you described as a political failure, not an intelligence failure. You didn't describe what you, in, what you meant by the failure, what you thought that the United, think the United States should have done, could have done. Uh, and in your very final sentence, you sort of implied the United States government should not now conduct a relationship with this Russian government. I would like to ask you what specifically you think a government like ours should, could, would do with a government like this one, and would you apply that to other kleptocratic, kleptocratic governments in the world, of which I think I could name you 30 or 40. <laughs> you know, I spent two very interesting years in the State Department when Gorbachev came to power, and one thing that I really learned was that this is a group of people who are very expert, and they think very deeply about these things. So I'm not um, really interested in criticizing government policy per se. But I do think that um, when we have a situation, since you mentioned the, pro the generalized problem of kleptocracies, in which um, it's possible to open up accounts without the names, the names of beneficial owners, then this is something that could be changed. Um, the former media minister, Lessin, who's now the new media czar, uh, was revealed by the LA Times to have three properties in LA, which were registered in the names of numbers, despite the fact that these properties are inhabited by, it, two of them are inhabited by his children. So allowing uh, anyone, whether they're Russian or not Russian, to buy a property with a number, an LLC which has the title only of a number, LLC number 423, strikes me as something that perhaps is not in our interest in the long term. I don't know if any of you have been to Miami recently, not mine, but the other one. Um, <laughs> we don't have a problem with people buying, buying real estate in Miami. Uh, but in Miami, Florida, the landscape of Miami, Florida has been really transformed by the purchase of real estate for the sole purpose of money laundering. Real people aren't living in these apartments. 
there are apartments that are completely empty and that, ex that are exchanged, as in Belgravia, as in the Côte d'Azur, are exchanged in payment for debts because they're worried about you know, the reliability of the banking system. That problem has only increased, of course, with sanctions. So there are things that I think are generalized problems that uh, that could definitely deal that could definitely be dealt with, and I do think that the U.S. government is aware of them and is now going to become even more committed to dealing with this problem. Andre, first of all, congratulations uh, with uh, your book and presentation. I have two questions related to each other. One is uh, directly to you. You named the book Kleptocracy. Why, among different features of the systema that you have described, like mafia, thugs, KGB, others, you've chosen exactly this particular feature as uh, the most important, uh, just to name the book. Maybe some others are equally important, or maybe some other reasons, just if you can discuss what was the reason and what other features are important. And another one, probably for both Karen and Elizabeth, for you maybe, William, you would participate in this contest as well. Um, if we will think about the classification of political regimes around the world and historically, where would you put this particular example? Uh, which particular regime would remind you would be similar to this one, historically or internationally? Well, I do say that in the book that many words have been used to describe this, whether corporation or Kremlin Inc. or kleptocratic or sistema. I'm a great admirer of Ledionova's book on Sistema, for example. But I think that the word kleptocracy correctly conveys a normative evaluation. That this is a system that we shouldn't in any way condone by calling it something that doesn't travel, like Sistema. I mean, the Russian, Russian elites call the system themselves, Sistema. So, th and, and I'm fine with that. I'm not saying it shouldn't be called that, but I do think that when a book is published in the States, conveying a sense of what we're really talking about here. And the major feature of this system is theft. It's theft from, e from the state, to private individuals. And when I say the state, I mean that includes all Russians. So when we talk about 110 and 871, how did they get to 871? Because of the 110. So I, I think it's important to convey that. It's, um, I think historically, it is a system without parallel. I mean, in the, in the size of the, uh, in the size of the um, effort. Now, I've had long discussions with many friends at panels and so forth about fascism. Should we start using the F word to describe Russia? Well, the, the difference between um, the fascist rise in Germany or elsewhere, but particularly in Germany and in, in Russia, is that in Russia, they, the greed is much more important to them than the ideology. The ideology is, a, is the kernel that they wrap it all up in, that they feed to the propaganda machine so that people, ordinary people, can feel that they have, you know, that, they, that they're contenders, right? That they could go off and fight somewhere, that Russia is back, and, and so forth. So I, I don't... One, of course, could use that, but also that that whole thing has been now b so debased by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So that's really why I chose the word kleptocracy. Uh, 
Just I'll jump go in. very briefly. I, don't, I really think the limelight should be on Karen. Um, I, I'm really interested in this term personalist regime because I think what's very interesting is the absence of a race publica, an absence of an understanding of a commonwealth and working for commonwealth. And part of that is I think Russia is extremely difficult to rule. I mean, the more I study Russian history, I teach it, the more I think it is going to always have pockets of corruption, et cetera. The United States was 13 small colonies with a bunch of white men who owned their slaves. They didn't have to contend. They had to make relations with each other that allowed them to build a sense of trust. That's changing in this global world. And one of the things that's so interesting about Karen's work is the ways in which they could create a liberal economy. This is I, I learned this from Karen's book. They could create a liberal economy within Russia while uh, getting rid of their uh, uh, contenders and storing the money globally. So I, I, I really think that's very important. So for me, the term that I I'm, I'm keep work coming back to is the term that um, one of the historians developed, Nancy Coleman, of the facade of autocracy. You create the appearance of top-down control, even though, as anybody who observes Russia at, at length knows, and many of the journalists are doing fantastic work on this, the clans are fighting under the rug. There, there's a constant tension over who can control which piece of the pie, but there's, it's very hard to be a do-gooder in a situation where the gains are too easy to hide. I mean, and I, I think, so the, the long-term question is going to be, how do you build institutions, checks and balances, when those have not historically, the Soviet Union created a moral system, a civilizing system, a whole lot of, you know, pressure on individuals, but it didn't create the right institutions because they undermined law, as I saw in performing justice. So if, if unless they find ways to, to rebuild in those institutions, it's going to come down constantly to individuals trying to make money off the system. That's that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay, I see a lot of hands coming up. So we're going to take three questions uh, right now. And please keep the questions short. So one, two, and three. So go ahead. Uh, since you asked the one about Yeltsin, um, could you say something about Ch Subchuk? Uh, at, at the late Gorbachev years and a year or two later, he was portrayed in the West as a liberal. Uh, how did he pick Putin, and wha or why did he pick? And d do you have anything in the book about the apartment house bombings? <laughs> I'm going to take a question right here. Thank you. I mean, you've already sort of touched on this, but if, as you say, greed is sort of paramount to this regime, all signs point to the fact that the Russian economy is not in tremendously good shape and will be getting only worse. It's all sort of well and good for Chim Timchenko to say that the, you know, his money is at the government's disposal. But what does happen when the money starts to disappear and you can't necessarily buy everyone off? Okay, and last question right in front here. Liz, we can just bring the microphone right here. Thank you. Uh, I'd appreciate no, no, if no, you no, could. No, 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 no. Hmm? Oh, okay. We're going to have this question here. We'll, we'll, you'll start the next okay. round, I promise you. There will be a next round. Go ahead. Thank you. Is it uh, fair uh, from your presentation and your book to say that, uh, you know, it's time to move uh, the study of uh, Russian politics from political science department to criminal studies and for the <laughs> to criminal <laughs> studies for the administration <laughs> instead of asking for the Wilson Center for advice on Russia to go to the FBI. And as far as the foreign uh, U.S. foreign policy is concerned, uh, the experience of the uh, Middle East, uh, you know, dealing with the Middle East where, you know, corrupt leaders is are, uh, everyone there. I mean, uh, uh, your conclusion, it seems that, uh, uh, it seems irrelevant. I mean, is that fair to say? Thank you. Okay. 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 Well, <coughs> yes, I do deal with the apartment bombings. In my opinion, the explanation for why Putin's uh, ratings went up from 2% to over 70% was because he became the war president. I also believe that the evidence suggests strongly that the Ryazan bombs that were planted, um, which led to FSB, um, FSB employees being arrested, W it was an FSB operation and was planned when Putin was head of the FSB. 
It's a very serious thing, uh, charge to make because it means that this is a massive false flag operation organized by a, a group close to Yeltsin to bring someone to power that downed by bombing three apartment buildings in Moscow. It's just a horrendous thing. While, while their residents were sleeping. This is no way to win an election. Subchak. Subchak. Well, Subchak was the darling of the West, and he loved to travel here. And he got many invitations to travel here, and he always got very, very good uh, press when he did. And um, there, Subchak was involved in corruption. He was willing to receive gifts, um, which, of course, in Russia is not necessarily corruption. Um, he, he and Putin received a Mercedes each in the very early 90s. And uh, when the American consulate in Petersburg called and said, we noticed that the elite is starting to drive Mercedes. I wonder if you could recommend the dealer. <laughs> the next day, Putin stopped driving his Mercedes and didn't drive it again. So Chuck continued to drive. That's a difference. So Chuck was protected by the aura of being, you know, a liberal Democrat. He was one of the big Democrats. And he continued to be that way. I think he died under very, very mysterious circumstances. I won't say anything more about that. Um, there were two autopsies. I will say one thing about it. There were two autopsies, one that was, was held in Kaliningrad, in which the prosecutor said that we're going to open a case of death under mysterious circumstances. His body was taken to the main medical academy uh, run by the soon-to-become Minister of Health under Putin, was given a second autopsy. It was announced that he had died of a heart attack. He was buried the next day. Um, what happens when the money runs out? Well, I think that this is um, the message of Yevtushenko. What happens when the money runs out is that they will go around and take it from whoever has it. The money is now back in Russia. And, uh, but I agree that even that money might run out. I think it would be hard to shake some of it loose. Um, but they already have started to raid the pension funds. They've already announced that for the next two years in a row, the budget for, the he for health will be cut in the double digits. So they'll also just take more out of the population. Should the FBI get involved? Well, they're already invo involved. They've, al they've been involved. There's FBI officers in Moscow, and they've been there for some time. So th there are also Treasury people. And this has become a multi-agency challenge, as it should be. It's a good question, though. Okay. Let's start here, here, and here. OK. Um, I, I would just appreciate if you would elaborate on Matt's comments at the opening about there not being one bank account, which I assume you agree with. Um, it is, in fact, a common, for lack of a better word, solution being pushed here in Washington is if we could just shut down the bank accounts. We know what, what they are, and you certainly seem to know. <laughs> right here. Hi, uh, my name is Bogdan Tsuk, and I'm a journalist from Voice of America Ukrainian Service. Um, my question is about um, Ukraine, war in Ukraine. Why do you think Putin bothered himself with this? Um, was change in Ukraine, the, the fall down of Yanukovych, a threat to Putin's system? Or did he Putin just wanted to play nationalistic cards or revanchist cards to pursue political reasons? Or was it really a threat to him, what happened in, in Kiev? And right here, third question. Ms. Wood's third question was about sanctions. Are, are they going to do any good? OK, bank accounts. I don't know the bank. If I knew the bank account, I'd be sitting in the south of France enjoying myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the tragedy of Putin is that, I mean, for, from Putin's point of view, 
is that look, the State Department in the, in the, or the Treasury announced, when they announced the sanctions, there is one sentence that's more important than all the others. And the one sentence is that Vladimir Putin owns shares in Gunvor. It's in the State Department. It's in the Treasury de uh, sanctions list. So they really are signaling. I mean, this is a signaling game. They really are signaling that we know a lot about this. I don't think they know everything, but they know a lot. So when Temchenko sold his share the day before the sanctions came down, sold his own share, did he also sell Putin's share? What hap what's happening to Putin's money? I don't, I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Putin is supposed to have a, a large portion in bearer shares. You know, if you own this piece of paper and it's a bearer share, you have you own them you own that, and if you give it to Elizabeth, she owns it. Well, what if you're in Moscow and you can't get out, or you you want to to cash this stuff in? You've got it in a bank. I mean, that's what Kolesnikov states, that they used to manage uh, Shamalov used to manage Putin's private money. Most of it was in bearer shares, not all of it, but a lot of it. How are you going to? How are you going to cash that? How are you going to live better with bear shares that you can't get to? So I think that there is a personal problem for Putin. Um, why did Putin bother himself with Ukraine? I think that there have been mistakes. I, th I think he would probably himself regard um, the situation there as not an ideal situation. I mean, one would hope so, anyway. Um, but one shouldn't overlook the extent to which the oligarchs around him own huge assets in Ukraine, especially in southeast and south Ukraine, of course in Crimea, but also in Odessa. And for any of you who are interested, I, I really do commend a, a work called the Odessa Network, which talks about um, the details of people like Chemezov, who's you know, one of Putin's very um, major allies who was with him in, in Dresden, and how Chemezov owns um, major parts of the ports in Odessa. And a lot of the arms that go to Syria are going through Chemezov's operations in East Ukraine, uh, arms, arms production, and then through Odessa. So there's a big financial uh, interest that the people around Putin have in Ukraine. It's very, very important. And I think that when Yanukovych fled, which uh, obviously wasn't planned by, by the Kremlin, they wanted him to stay. <laughs> um, but when he fled, a lot of those interests were suddenly extremely exposed. Um, sanctions. Yeah, sanctions, and I, I wanted to add to that. Okay, why don't you add to that, and then we'll... But so, so I want I to I come back, also ask about the sanctions again, because um, it, we remember when Khodorkovsky was arrested in 2003-04, all the, I have, uh, I've uh, started writing about this, the al other oligarchs all came and bowed down. Yes, we will give to your national funds. Yes, we will do this. Yeah, we will do that. What about the, the chance that, th since this is a shell game anyway, to a certain extent, it's like the Soviet Union. Ownership doesn't matter. Connections matter, right? So if Putin has all the connections, and moreover, they have an interest in him staying in power, do, it, it, you can have all this. It, it, maybe the sanctions are our best solution because they're non-military, uh, et cetera. But d what are the chances that the oligarchs are going to keep uh, bowing down, especially given those signals? And, and so it doesn't matter who owns it. You're not going to get Putin. And even if you, you know, you see my point. So I think that there are two... Um, positive possible outcomes to sanctions, in addition to a range of negative. But let's talk about positive. Positive possible outcomes to sanctions. One is that we'll set them against each other. I would imagine that the US government, in talking about sanctions, thought that this was a positive thing. Instead of having the stable, unified leadership, why don't we, why don't we stir it up and see what happens? So. There is that, that it will decrease the stability of Putin's hold on power. I think that that is 
regarded by um, those governments that have gone through with sanctions as positive. There's also a, a second, maybe this is just a fanciful posi positive outcome. In the book, I talk a lot about Mansur Olson's ideas of um, the transition from authoritarian, authoritarian to democratic regimes and how you need to create an incentive for rule of law. That rule of law emerges from property rights. When people have property, they will become interested in protecting it, and they will help shape laws. We call it K Street, right? So they will, way they will protect themselves, and that's how laws emerge and how laws uh, are shaped. In Russia, it's different. In Russia, up until now, uh, predation and looting is what happens in Russia. The protection of property is what happens in Europe. So the money leaves Russia and is put into European banks, and those people who have looted Russia protect their gains in Europe. So the rule of law is not emerging in Russia because they don't have an interest in it emerging. Now they're all home. Do they now have an increased interest in the rule of law? It is <coughs> entirely possible that when the Union of Industrialists uh, petitioned for Yevtushenko's release from house arrest, one of their efforts was to say, but he owned it legally. Even Kudrin said he got approval for the purchase of Bashnev all up the line. So not only did he own it legally, but that it was approved at the top. We can't go back on these kinds of agreements. And the message is, well, guess what? There's a new set of rules. So it, from that point of view, I'm a little discouraged by the message that's coming from the Kremlin, which is rule of law, come on. We, didn't li we lived without it for all this time. We're not going to introduce it now. But we shouldn't uh, completely dismiss the power of the 110. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our session, but I, I have one last question, and it, it follows on this question about property rights and property being overseas in Europe, and oligarchs can go visit their money anytime, or at least have up till now been able to visit the money when they want to. Um, you talk about this as a Russian story, but in light of what you talk about, how complicit is the West in yeah. this whole story? Uh, you talk about offshore accounts, shell companies, non-beneficial owners of accounts, bearer shares. They have seem to have learned a lot over the last 23 years, um, and it seems to be focused on how one conducts offshore banking in many ways. So again, have they, what lessons have they learned and how complicit is the West in teaching those lessons? Uh, the West is, well, Western banking is extremely complicit. There's no, there's no question. Bank of New York. We kn I mean, this was a Yeltsin story. Why is this continuing? Bank of New York was a Yeltsin story. Uh, so there's a lot of money to be made in Russia. When we see that Citigroup is thinking about withdrawing its f or closing its 50 offices in uh, Russia, well, okay. So what, what, what has what have been the rules for um, loans, bonds, IPOs? How much money has been made from Russian IPOs that were poorly prepared and introduced in London? Poorly prepared from a legal standpoint. And who is benefiting from that? Well, who's preparing the IBOs, IPOs? Who are they accounting? Well, I, I know this is a subject close to your heart since you worked for one of them in Moscow. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm an accounting firm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the accounting firms holding their noses and, and signing off on gas prone bo bottom lines. I mean, how much money was made in a, when they turned the other way and didn't look at the quality of, of, the, of the numbers and the lack of transparency. But then, uh, you know, Bank America is a whole, you know, sheets are evidently forged or, 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 or made up. That's what we're learning. So, you know, there's a big problem with the banking industry as a whole, and certainly Russia was the place to be. Um, 
Browder, who I think has been extremely brave, well, until 2003, he was making a lot of money in Russia. And he was looking the other way when he became the head of many companies. So. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. <laughs> the, book is, the book's available outside, and thank you so much for coming.